Why, hello there. It's me, Jeremy, your favorite bald dude telling you about Standard and Strange, a store and a brand with simple rules. Sell clothes they themselves would wear, manufacture it ethically, and build it to last. From boots made in Oregon to loop wheel garments made in Japan, find all the best clothes for your wardrobe at Standard and Strange. Standardandstrange.com. Here we go. Hello, everyone. Happy fall. It's Jeremy Kirkland, your favorite bald boy. This is Blamo. How y'all doing? Are we doing all right? Everyone hanging in there? Are we freaking out? Freaking out on Twitter? Maybe you're me and you were just like, nope, you, you just deleted the app. Now, look, I, I didn't delete my account because, you know, maybe I want to take a peek at the hellfire on occasion. I'm, I'm just being truthful. But I did, I did want to make it harder for me to look at it every time, you know, every time I'm doing nothing, sitting on the toilet, being an idiot, whatever that is. But gosh, I wish I wasn't so addicted to my phone, but, but I love it so. I love my phone. But, ugh, it's, what, a, what a tangled web. Speaking of love, we got a big, big, big pod with the real OG in the podcast world, Ms. Avery Truffleman. She created the incredible show about the history of fashion and clothing called Articles of Interest in 2018. And recently, she launched her third season of Articles of Interest uh, just a few weeks ago. It's, it's incredible. If you haven't heard it, please go check it out. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. And normally, it's a bit hard to talk to journalists on a podcast because sometimes they're a little evasive, maybe a bit hesitant to give their opinion. And, you know, we, we kind of keep it real here on The B. But Avery, oh, man, she went there. Actually, we went there. And I will say, I think I learned more about myself on this pod as much as I learned about her. I mean, and I'm very grateful to her for that. Avery and I discuss her new season of Articles of Interest, American Ivy, the state of prep and the future of it, why she finds the story of prep redemptive, and how every generation of clothing shows where we are as a culture. Here we go. Man, I'm such an idiot too. I wasn't even recording that like oh. butter up compliment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll happily uh, restate it to you anytime you want. But I don't know. I just feel like in especially clothing, in this mm -hmm. expertise that like goes on forever and ever and you'll never master it. I mean, I've been doing radio for a decade, but I've only been doing fashion for like since 2018. So I'm so new. And in so many ways, I like look up to you. Well, I mean, that's very, I'm very flattered, but like, no, you've been doing fashion. You just probably haven't done it as a profession because Ooh. everyone that does this stuff. <laughs> no, I'm serious. It's like everyone that does this, like it, you're all, we're all doing it. It's just whether or not you're going to like confront the elephant in the room. And it's like when, when you start having to have that conversation, you're forced to, to back up your decisions that you make. That's very well said. Touche. All right. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you, you got, you got your own style and looks and all these things. I mean, okay, not to like totally turn the tables on you. I promise I'll let you ask me questions. Yeah, go but for like, it. Okay. Is it, you know, everyone, people would say like, doesn't everyone have their own sense of style? Isn't everyone engaging in fashion? Okay, fair. You got me. I mean, I, I think um, mo most often the people that, that say they don't care, care the most. Mm -hmm. And it's really just a way to protect themselves. Like, you know, like from, from the guy who's just buying stuff on Bonobos and he's like, I don't give a shit. And he's just like, I just get, you know, as long as they make my chinos, I'll keep buying them sort of thing versus the people that are like, you know, and, and I say this cause he's a good friend, like someone like Chris Black, who's just like, I don't care about any of this stuff deep down inside. He does. And we all do. And, and he, he would probably even admit that like, this yeah. is no shots at him. He's a homie. Um, you know, it's, it's just, it's like you, you kind of like figure out who your audience is and how much you're going to reveal about him. But it's like fashion is just like psychology and geometry. It's just kind of scary. Yes. 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 <laughs> but I'm I'm a huge fan of the series that you've done, especially because you you elevated what was Ring Ding's like talking on Style Forum uh, to to actually having like real journalism and and you know exploring the 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 psychological trauma that we're trying to like put ourselves through for this stuff. So a huge huge honor to chat with you. Oh my God! Thank you so much. Like, because you're a professional journalist in the sense that you know I've done enough interviews and research on you you're it's it's tough to find what your bias is it's tough to find which is good because that's what a professional journalist should be is your your reporting versus in the the fashion world you know i'm just air quoting that it 
there isn't really anything controversial other than maybe what's happened the past five or 10 years into which now people's political affiliations are coming in. Totally, totally. And that's the other thing. Like sometimes I get asked to do live interviews on stage. It's like, I could not tell you how completely different an art form that is than like what I do. Like, because when you're when you're doing a live interview on a stage, you actually are like minding the clock, trying to make sure that every answer is interesting and you can't actually do the the like organic meandery thing. I was gonna say people are more guarded yeah. when they're around other people. For some reason, yeah. even though, you know, thousands of people will listen, it's like there's not a there's because there's no one else looking at them, you know. And I feel like people are okay to take their time on answers where it's like I've done a lot of panels and symposiums or whatever bullshit people will try to call them, and they usually come out kind of weird and it's the same things of like clothing is like armor and we love to, you know, and the roots of this was that and you're just like fucking hell like just admit the fact that like we all are vain and we're trying to like set ourselves apart <laughs> wait can i ask what is your background do you have a um yeah how did you get to this place um i mean it depends on how deep you want to go but the 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 what is your childhood T trauma <laughs> the tldr is like i was a failed musician mm -hmm. i worked in the indie music industry for a long time then i was like a sort of wannabe fashion blogger or journalist journalist sure. kind of person, worked in the fashion industry for a few years. And during that time, recognized that all the relationships and friends I had, um, like the, the the close personal friends I had, had all become incredibly successful in their own right. And I wanted to make a podcast. And this is like 2016. And people didn't really know like what a podcast was at the time. And the ones that did it were like stuff like what you were doing with like 99% Invisible and right. stuff like, like true audio journalism, like cinematic experience. Um, versus, you know, Mark Maron talking in a garage right, right. style thing. And uh, I started doing it, but I've kind of been in this weird mindset of just like, if you're going to do something, like get feedback, improve, um, don't put anything out in the world unless you're, you want to present yourself and improve upon it over time. Um, and so I did that and I was kind of doing that on the side. Uh, and then it kind of popped off a bit, you know, and there's like, I don't know, maybe you have this or not, like podcasts don't really have like hockey stick growth anymore. You kind yeah. of like incremental climb and plateau and exactly. stuff. Exactly. Well, now everyone, find, you find your niche and then you're yeah. like, now I'm home. Yeah. I, I, I too, I'm just like, what is growth? What's the end goal? What's sustainability with this? Especially with something like fashion that can be niche or can be wide and you can really turn the levers. So I don't know. I mean, the interesting thing is, well, one, I'm very interested in the way that age factors into it for you. And you're like, am I still going to be doing this in my 40s? Because I think about, especially in menswear and especially with not, if you're, if you're focusing on clothing and style and not necessarily trends, like that, especially if you look at like Bruce Boyer, that's a very ageless, in a weird way, you know, as you age into it and your style becomes like more and more time proven. Sure. It like is a it's a boon. And then the other the other factor I would say is like you were so on the cutting edge of this. I mean, even, you know, five years ago when I started Articles of Interest, people didn't want to talk about fashion like at all. Like attitudes towards clothing have changed so much, even in the recent past where people are now sort of seeing it as what it is, which is, as as, Ra as Rachel Tashian told me, a source of intellectual delight. It really is like people, there's so many pieces now in like mainstream publications, you know, doing the sort of like rigorous analysis of what we wear. And they're all like looking for experts. And so in a weird way, yeah, I feel like my, my, my counter argument to you is like, isn't aging supposed to be cool in menswear and isn't being a clothing expert like a relatively if not lucrative thing, uh, more sensible and visible than it's ever been in the past. I think th that you're right. You're right. I think the thing, and maybe I'm like realizing this as I'm saying it, where it's like, I'm embarrassed of clothes, you know, like I, I'm ashamed in all honesty, because it, it, it's when you look at like the grand scheme of things. And also when you spend all this time talking to people, it's like, we care so much about things that in life are essentially meaningless. And at the end of the day, like the things that we really cling on to, when people talk about watches, they're talking about the relationship. When they're talking about clothes, they're talking about a memory. So this stuff is fucking hollow and empty. And so when you become an expert on that, you, it, it, it I silo myself into, um, I don't know, emotional anxiety. Like it's, it's not so, I mean, and that's, that's something that I, I really wrestle with where I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm embarrassed 
to to admit that I I care about this stuff because in, in as 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 we're more global and we're seeing all these things and everything happening at the world like fucking the world's on fire in Ukraine and there's war and there's and all sorts of stuff which let me be clear has existed for a long time you know the Rwandan genocide and all these things were going on and we were going to Ralph Lauren's show so like it just feels so much real so much more real and all of these realities are existing simultaneous on the same platform and so it's like I don't really feel like I deserve uh, any seat at that that table because I'm not changing the world. Have you always and felt I that embarrassment or is this like a new thing? It's new. When did it's this very start? new. Uh <laughs> Like I'm talking to my therapist now. Um, I don't know, probably more recently with just like as I've gotten older and I had kids and, you know, my dad's dying and oh, my, sorry. you know, um, I've seen friends like get married and get divorced. And I've, you know, I've been married like 12 years and we've had issues, but I mean, we're fine. Everything's fine. But just like, sure, it's like- the, yes, yeah, the, the, that part versus me living in the Lower East Side, like blowing money on Dior jeans, like I'm some fucking cool kid going to a Miss Shapes thing, you know, like you just, you, you get back. You, you you experience more of life and then maybe some of the things I'm like, oh shit, I'm like putting all my stock in like being this clothing expert, but you know, my friend's a surgeon. Like what the, you know, what the fuck am I doing? You know? So yeah. I've been thinking about this. No, I've been thinking about this a lot lately. I've been thinking about this a lot lately. Oh, I I don't know. I think it's a really interesting thing to talk about. Have you seen Triangle of Sadness? Um, No, it is. It's, I'm supposed to see it this week. So we, we will see. Man, I would love to know your thoughts because it's it really <laughs> had me reeling because it's very much about like the world of goods, you know, doesn't doesn't matter. And I've been very haunted by that also. It's really funny that you say that. I, yeah, I've been I've been having a similar crisis. Um, but, you know, OK, I'll tell you something that just happened to me just now. Um, but like, OK. So I, um, I have a lump in my breast. I don't know what it is. We'll see. Oh shit. I, it'll, no, no, we'll be, we'll see. It's fine. Like, okay. it'll probably be fine. But I just came from the radiologist today. So I was almost going to email you and be like, oh my God. Like, cause well, cause my appointment lasted like longer than I thought it would. And I really oh found my myself God. looking at my whole life and starting to cry. And it was interesting because I had this very no nonsense a uh, sonogramist who is Polish and she was like, oh, you know, uh, she, and she was like, I think it's fine. She's like, I, I, I think it's OK. You know, and I'm like crying. She's like, oh, please just come back in six months. You'll be you'll be fine. And I forget. We started talking. She she asked me. I was like, I actually have something at noon. I have to go. And she's like, what, what do you do? And I told her I'm a journalist. And she you didn't say podcaster. <laughs> I'm a fashion. Well, it's funny. She said, what do you cover? And I said, fashion. And she said, well, it's a living. And I was like, uh, you know, then I was like really embarrassed that I actually care about it. And I said, how long have you been a sonogramist? And she said, 30 years. And I was like, oh, that's so amazing that you, you know, help people in this way and you're saving lives. And she's like, well, can I tell you what I really want to do? I really want to be a children's book author. And then she proceeded to like, tell me the plot of this like beautiful children's book that she's working on. And it was just this nice reminder. It was honestly a pretty good, like children's books are, are not easy to write. And it was a pretty good idea, but it was the kind of thing that was like one, yes, the grass is always, always greener and that humans will always have a desire for beauty and symbolism and the world of like aesthetic representation, even for those who tangibly work with their hands and help people every day. We want beauty in our lives. We want stories in our lives. We want to be represented and to be seen. And it made me realize like, oh, if I wasn't doing this, I would still be interested in it. As you said, as you said in the beginning, when you're like, haven't you been doing this before you've been, before you did it professionally? You know what I mean? And so, okay. yeah, on the one hand, what, what to be an expert in clothes, in the words of Renata Adler in Speedboat, there's, um, when she quotes a girl on the titular speedboat who t looks at her and says, when you've got a suntan, what have you got? And I think about that all the time. It's just like, OK, we've got this thing. What have we got? Oh, it means man. as much as anything else, you know, and it brings a lot of people a lot of joy. And it is political, you know, there, as you know, I don't have to tell you, there's like politics and how these things are manufactured and marketed and the fantasies that we hold about ourselves and about our society as they're manifested in clothes. And this is also coming from an architecture background. I mean, let me tell you, architecture is also, I mean, there are a lot of messed up practices and like the way buildings are made. And like, we think clothes are a wasteful industry. Maybe buildings is like, a, and tearing down buildings is a really wasteful industry. But we have way more control over what we put on our bodies than like the cities we walk in and the buildings we walk in. And we can help each other make more informed decisions about that. So I don't know. Is it worth it? Is it not? 
Yes and no. Go see Triangle of Sadness. Tell me what you think. You'll love it. It'll haunt you. I'm so sorry. It's going to haunt you. It really haunts me. Yeah. Someone was like, oh, don't eat. And I was like, oh, oh great. yeah, don't eat. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to Don't see eat. It. Don't drink. Don't buy food. <laughs> I was like, don't don't eat. Like, that's that's your review. Your two word review is don't eat. That's a perfect review. That's a perfect <laughs> review. But I feel yeah, you. So, I really feel you. What? It, it just in the, the existential, you know. And the embarrassment and the embarrassment. My boyfriend just took me to yeah. task the other day. He, he was like, why do you always apologize? when people ask you what you do. And I'm like, because if I don't admit that I know that it's embarrassing, they don't know that I know that it's embarrassing and they think I'll take it seriously. And that's even more embarrassing. You know, it was so stupid. Okay, let's let's pick at this right now. Because this is, I think we have the same yeah. sort of, yeah. it's either that like we're raised in households of shame <laughs> or you you as you get older you recognize like what like privilege is and and the, the advances you had even though um you know i i talk about when i was younger we we didn't have a ton of money and i grew up in a neighborhood like this and this and this but like still i grew up in the united states we had food i've never actually known what hunger is so there's all these things that even though in my head i'm like oh i, I had it kind of rough and it's like no you fucking didn't you know you had generic cereal instead so like you, you're you're fine um and so like realizing that or it's like not having enough you 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 want to be so humble that your humbleness is actually like what holds you down like there's so many times like opportunities will happen and someone's like oh jeremy you should do this and i'm like oh no not me i mean they probably don't want to you know some sort of like mumbling to myself and then some ding dong does it and i'm like that guy's a fucking hack <laughs> <laughs> So I don't know. Do you ever feel the same way? Not that you, uh, you know, lament, but you mean in terms of being like try, trying in to in terms of maybe yourself. being like, yeah, yeah. Separating yourself from your career, but also like you were saying, you you when you introduce people, there's an asterisk or you kind of shame yourself preemptively. Well, yeah, I definitely shame myself preemptively. I definitely think how do I put this? you know, it's funny. So like this season of articles of interest is about preppy clothes. And there was this great yeah. quote that I don't think I actually put in the series, but I've been thinking about a lot. It was from an F. Scott Fitzgerald book. I forget which one, but basically this character claims he doesn't belong at Princeton. You know, he like grew up poor. He's an outsider. He doesn't relate to mm -hmm. these people. And he's like, oh, everyone here cares too much about their clothes. And then one of the boys takes him aside and they're like, listen, for better or worse, you have it. You're graduating with a degree. You're just like us. Like, you can say that you're different all you want to the rest of the world. You came from Princeton. So drop it. You know, basically like <laughs> you're wasting all this time. Just yeah. like you're 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 focusing on your your differences. And so I think about this all the time is like I I I and that's that's not prescriptive at all. That's not me telling you anything. I I think I no, just no. I I I don't know. I feel like the, the the privilege argument is like, yeah, very, 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 very aware of my privilege, very like grateful and full of responsibility. To to like try to do a, a good job and tell good stories um, in, in this like ultimately quite uh, lucky, silly profession. And I think, I mean, I think the thing that's embarrassing for me, and I don't know if this is part of why you feel embarrassing is because like, I, I do, I do love it. You know, I love <laughs> listening to like binging a really good podcast and feeling very like inspired and connected to that person. Uh, or, you know, I'm reading an amazing graphic novel right now and just like loving, loving it, loving it, loving, feeling connected to someone else's brain, going to an art retrospective and just like loving, 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 knowing what this other person is thinking. It is like a form of falling in love, like getting to know someone uh, through their art. And, um, and I love audio and I think audio is like sacred and 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 I really 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 care about it and um, I don't know in the have you seen the movie uh, The Last Black Man in San Francisco no there's a part where these two girls on the bus in San down. Francisco are like complaining about the city and they're like ah San Francisco it sucks um, and then the protagonist taps him on the shoulder and they're like and he's I, I'm misquoting this but he's he says something to the effect of like excuse me did you ever love San Francisco then you can't talk about it that way like you can't hate something like that until you've loved it and I think that's part of my embarrassment is just like i love it i love it so much i love it so much i love it so much that like it leads to yeah. critique it leads to hate like i love america so much so i i hate it you know i i want it to be the thing that i love so i critique it you know yeah i mean i think that's a very intelligent like mature way to think about it too because otherwise it becomes easier to to go on either side of that where you hate it so much that you're you're ashamed like and and you and you never really embrace it even though that privately that's how you feel like that's yeah i mean i think i definitely feel that way too i mean which 
I think like that's that's the stuff with podcasting too, where because I do the same thing whenever I introduce myself, people are like, what do you do for a living? Like the other day I was at a playground, my daughter was playing, just being a goofball. And I was talking to this guy and he was like, so what sort of work do you do? And I was like, I, uh, <laughs> same. That's always what I do. <laughs> talk to people about clothes. And he was like, that sounds really cool. Oh, awesome. And I was like, oh, um, yeah, yeah. I was like, I make a podcast. And he was like, oh, cool. And he's like, you know, and of course he immediately references like Barstool Sports. And then I was like, well, I don't really make that. 100%. Sort of <laughs> 100%. He's like, oh, like a stoolie? And I was like, what? Stoolie? I was like, oh, oh, bar stool. And I'm like, oh. And I was like, wait, you got kids. What do you mean? What are you listening to bar stool? But it was like, it was interesting because he was into it. And then I was like, oh, what sort of work do you do? And he was like, oh, I don't do anything cool. I was like, what do you do? And he's like, I, uh, I help research and make medicine for Pfizer. And I was like, that's, that's pretty so fucking cool. cool. Yeah. And he was like, yeah, it's dumb. I just like sit in a chemistry lab. I was like, so you sit in a chemistry lab listening to Barstool Sports Podcast making cancer medicine? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, okay, okay. You know what? We're, we're all complex Yes, exactly, exactly. Here. That's like, I don't know. There's a, there's yeah, a place he, in this world for everyone, I'd like to believe. Sure. Yeah, because he was like, yeah, my friends and I were thinking about making a podcast too. Like, it'd be really funny. We can like talk about how like medicine's like really dumb and goofy and we all like take it and we don't even know what we're taking. And I was like, uh, uh, that's like George Carlin stuff. Like, are you like, yeah, like you. And then he was like, yeah, I'm going to do a podcast too. And maybe that's the thing sometimes because like the medium of podcasting and there is like to do anything really, really well requires an absurd amount of effort and knowledge and training and all of these things. But to enter the medium, mm -hmm. It's just like when everyone in the music industry realized that you could make an album on like garage band. Totally. Right? Like I talk about this all the time. In the 1970s, the only people that had recorded music in most cases were ones that were either absurdly wealthy or extremely talented. Right. Because it was so difficult to capture what you were doing on a recording. Right. Like it was just impossible to do. Right. And so it was just that the, the, the cream all went to the top. Right. right. And now, yeah, like people just like bust out their phones and are doing these podcasts. And when I'm, when I sell, tell someone I do a podcast, they're like, oh, cool. But like, what do you do for a living? And I'm like, no, 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 I make a podcast. And they're like, oh, so, so it's like, it's, it's, it's both sides. Yes, yeah, exactly. That, that happens simultaneously. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, the funny thing is I, um, I always joke that like there was never a moment when podcasting was just cool. Like it was podcast. What's that? And then it went right to like, oh, everyone has a podcast. Yeah, um, yeah. Oh, true crime. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you know, um, the the choreographer Twyla Tharp has this excellent book called The Creative Habit, where she talks about how she, as a dancer, just decides to take herself seriously. She's like, when I tell people I'm a dancer, they don't. It's very. It, it's it's easy to be written off. Like anyone can dance. And mm -hmm. so she's like, I take myself very seriously. She has a very rigid routine. She keeps herself to a very high standard. And she's like, no one will take you seriously but you. Um, so you have to just take yourself seriously. And and which I kind of like more than like believe in yourself. Because <laughs> Yeah, that's tacky. Because I do, I do take myself seriously, um, and I do think that's the embarrassing part. Is when I'm like, no, I'm not serious. Podcast. I'm like a real. But um, I do believe you're wearing a black turtleneck. I know. I was like, this is so embarrassing. It was just because I just got back from the. No, it's very serious. I can tell you were. This was very serious. I think it was like my grandma's. This is not. <laughs> oh wow! Here we go now. Oh, this old thing. This old thing. It's, it's some, I don't even know how to pronounce it. It's like Yoshi from, uh, or, oh, oh, Yoshi. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's what it is. I just wear it every day because I don't even care about clothes. Yeah. Yeah, who cares? <laughs> So embarrassing. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the series. So this is the third season. Yeah. And this is the first one that is one singular topic. Yes. Now, I, I've only heard like excerpts of stuff. But, you know, I did like your your intro, like your trailer, because you talked with Dick Carroll, yeah. which is an old colleague of mine at the Armory when we used to work there back in the day. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm curious why one, the focus of prep and how deep do you get into prep and the, uh, I don't know, maybe some spoilers here, I guess. I, I apologize. Oh yeah, no, I'm all about the spoilers. Um, well, one, I just love, I do, it's a very small world that I feel like I've been able to tap into, like not only with Dick, but like Alan Flusser and like Derek Guy, and you're going to, you specifically are going to know so many people in this. And um, as for why, so the, the theme is like prep, but really Ivy, which is like the precursor yeah. to prep. And yeah. it just felt like I was going to do one episode about this. And then the more I learned about it, the more I just realized it was like a fish learning what water 
is. It's like, oh, this is American clothes. This is America, a story of how Americans dress in the 20th century. And it's functionally about uh, the shift from Brooks Brothers to Ralph Lauren. And like, that's the, that's like an all American story. It's really so much uh, deeper and more brambly than I could have ever imagined. And so right away, I was like, okay, I think this is more than one episode. And then as I started working on it, I was like, oh, shit, this is like seven episodes, which I was really only able to do because this is my first season that I'm doing it. It used to be housed within 99% Invisible and 99% Invisible is an architecture podcast. And so Articles of Interest was always like, hey, can I interest you in fashion? But now, (laughs) you know, the beauty of this like atomized media landscape is like, if you have come to this feed, you already care. So let's just go really deep and let's just go all the way down the rabbit hole. So as to the question of how deep I go, I feel like I want you to challenge me. Like how, 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 how deep would you consider a deep cut in the world of Ivy Preppy? I think the deeper you get, the more you, you get away from it because, um, one, you find out that everyone is just appropriating each other. And two, like you, you either the, the, the real Ivy side would just say, no, it was about this, this, and this, and that's, and we, we, we can't ever change. And what you find out of like clothing now, like I do not take credit for this quote. Someone said this when they were talking about Ame Leandor, when it was like, ALD was white people appropriating, black people appropriating polo. Yes, 100%. That 100%. So like, but, and I used to cringe at that and be really angry. And then I was like, oh, actually, maybe that is just America in in, and of itself is that we're, we're all stealing from each other. We're all learning from each other. We're all inspired by each other and we can all make whatever we have our own. And isn't that great? And we should all be happy. But the true prep Ivy curmudgeon thing is like, no. This is for this, and you get this. You don't wear Princeton colors if you don't go to Princeton. And it's like, well, fuck you. I can wear whatever I want, and I can look this way, and I'm going to do it better than you. So, like, I think there's, when I say, like, how deep you go, it's like it, you're rebellious or purist. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, definitely. I mean, the whole thing is like a peon to to appropriation. I mean, you look at J Press. Yeah. That was 1902. Like, this shit has been <laughs> happening for, like— <laughs> People who didn't go to Yale dressed like they went to Yale. Yeah. Period. And I mean, yeah, I mean, where the story really, 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 really begins is like the origins of Brooks Brothers, which are fascinating in like 1818. And that has nothing to do with collegiate dressing at that yeah. point. So it's 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 funny. It extends. I don't actually get into the more contemporary stuff like the Tom Brown ALD like world mm-hmm. almost one because I feel like like I'm too this world is too contemporary to really analyze it like I don't think we'll know a, a, like what to make of this most recent iteration until it's mm-hmm. passed especially because I mean in the first episode it's all about trends and how there's so much discussion about trends right now and how there're more trends than ever and the jury is sort of out on like what is what is what is in and so we ha- mm-hmm. you know the question is like are we having a preppy revival or are we not if we are it's certainly not as clear cut as it was in like the early to mid aughts so what is it is it is it is it niche is it just roiling under the surface the way it sort of always is as like classic dressing um and everyone has a different take on it so i want to ask you like what do you think the state of preppy is now uh the state of preppy it's it's kind of been reduced down to some sort of like awkward Awkward conformity of youth. Ha! Like, <laughs> I don't know. I think that the people that are really into like prep stuff now, um, don't know what it is. Mm. Like people that are buying rowing blazers are not connecting it to that stuff. And that's fine. They might just be buying it because it was a cool brand or a stylist gave it to them. That's cool. And I think for me, so much of anything I wore based on where I came from, I felt the need to back up why I wore it because I knew everything about yeah. it. And now I don't feel you need to have that deep of a relationship with any article of clothing to appreciate it. And, you know, like to go back to earlier, that's why like sometimes I'm a little bit embarrassed where someone's like, oh, I just got this. Why? Because I like it. And you're like, oh, shit. Well, well, in, in my head, I had to, I wrote a thesis that I was prepared to right, explain right, to anyone right, who right. asked me why I like something, you know? And so, yeah, I mean, but I think that the funny state of it where it's like you go to Dime Square or any of these like cool kid locations and they're all wearing, you know, some 90s Carhartt or some sort of thing like that. And it's funny because everyone's like, what is it with the state of youth? But like on the side, I read as a dork, I just love like old history books. And I've been reading like the history of the FBI by Tim Weiner, which is weird. Yeah, it's, it's good. Interesting. Um, 
yeah, Freedom of Inf- Information Act gets a lot of gets a lot of info out. Oh, wow. But every decade, every presidency, there was always a fear of what the youth were doing. And at the time, they were always finding some way to reinterpret their own culture through the mirror of what they experienced. Yeah. And that was reclaiming whatever clothes that they were wearing. And they would wear this way. I mean, you look at like kids in the 60s that were wearing, you know, this. And it's like, oh, shit, this is exactly what's happening now. It's just that because we're in a 24-7 news cycle and media is in our face all day, we we, we just kind of don't really realize it. Like, it's it's very, very cyclical. I mean, 90s were the same thing. People like, you're wearing your dad's old cardigan? What a dork. Oh, but you're making it cool in your way. You know, like that's what the fuck. That's every, it's every generation. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. (laughs) It's that time again. The time for the old Jer Bears picks from Standard and Strange. You know what I'm talking about. They're one of my favorite clothing stores on earth. With locations in Oakland, Santa Fe, and New York City, they have everything from incredible leather jackets and boots to the highest quality Japanese denim. Look, it's getting a little warm. And I'm loving their new gear from Orslo. But by the way, before I start going crazy, here's a little tip, folks. If you don't have a pair of fatigue pants in your wardrobe, you're just missing out. And pair it with the Western shirt from Standard & Strange and you're going to unite the world. Okay, this is, I mean, I'm serious, they're great. And look, if you're still thinking, just head over to standardandstrange.com and see why they're one of my favorite shops. I mean, what other retail store donates 2% of their revenue, not profits, to giving back? I love these folks, and so should you. So visit standardandstrange.com to learn more. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for their mailing list so you never miss the latest dope gear they have at standardandstrange.com. That's standardandstrange.com. No, it's funny. I feel like, um, you know, basically as I've looked at preppy clothes in every generation, you can see a little bit of where we are in them in like the you know in the bright young things and the youth subculture of like the 1920s and 30s you can see a little bit of like dime square nihilism you know in the (laughs) in the 70s you can see the like fear of stagflation and economic uncertainty like you can see parallels in every time and it's 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 funny i guess i just don't know how do i put this if Fashion is an external aesthetic result of like larger sociopolitical forces. I do not know in a scientific experiment if similar sociopolitical forces manifest the same kinds of clothes. Do you know what I mean? Like, I feel like there hasn't been enough tracking of fashion throughout time to like see if similar economic events lead to similar styles. And that's sort of what I've been thinking about as I've been making this series. But that's also part of why I'm like, I don't really know what the state of it is now. Wait, by the way, do you live in Manhattan? No, not anymore. Ah. I live in St. Louis, Missouri. Oh. Yeah. We had a COVID move and now I commute like every other month to New York. Oh, we should hang out sometime. That's awesome. Yeah. Wait, wait, where are you? You're, I'm in, you're, in, I'm in, you're in the city, right? Yeah, yeah. I had a COVID mood too. <laughs> yeah, I was I was there a couple weeks ago and then I, yeah, I just travel out for, for on the side of like people that I'll work with. I'll, you know, go take meetings there. Sure. Or I'll go record or I'll do whatever. Sure. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, it was, I was, we were in Bay Ridge with a, what, like a three year, I don't know how old she was, a two and a half year old or whatever. And everyone thought the world was going to end. Yeah. So we were just like, fuck it. And we bought a house and now I have two kids. Wow. So. Oh, you're yeah, doing now, the damn thing. Stuck. Congratulations. I know, right? It's uh it's it's great and and a ball of anxiety at all times. Sure. Um, but it is cool because you get you get to appreciate, especially when we're talking about clothes. My daughter really loves to dress herself. Like she takes a ton of pride in how she dresses herself. And, you know, at one on one hand, I was like, oh, that's cool. She cares about clothes. And it was like, no, she wants control. Exactly. And I feel like that's part of where the embarrassment comes from. Like as you have more means to express yourself as you age. Yeah. And you are able to like control what you do and how you spend your money and have more of a voice in other ways. You don't rely on clothing as much. Like I also felt this as a little kid. It was like the only thing I had control over a little bit. I didn't even like yeah. buy my own clothes. I just w- had, was able to control how I wore them. And it meant so much, it meant so much to me. So I don't know. I mean, so of course I'm like, that's so cool that she is, yeah, wants to assert herself. Yeah. And, and I used to be, I used to look at it from like a, you know, like why, what's wrong with her? 
there, you know, and then I was like, oh shit. Like I think the, the biggest thing that's happened since having kids is you realize that one, you are way too hard on your own parents. Mm. And, and two, you're like, oh, like I'm, I'm also doomed to make the same mistakes they did. Like, oh shit. And then you, you, you just kind of like take a step back and, you know, I, I want to empower my daughter. I want to, to let her, especially in whatever world that she's in, to let her know that like she can be whoever she wants to be and it's not going to be easy, but I love her and I care about her no matter what. And it's like, oh, actually my parents tried to do the exact same thing for me, even though I was like, fuck you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Your parents liked that you liked clothes? Yeah. I think they were awesome. they were into it. I mean, I was called the F word in high school sure. because I like to wear sport coats, you know. Um, oh, that's but, so uh, cool. Rock on. <laughs> We would have been friends. That's so cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Me, me, and like kids. Yeah, I was, I was, I thought I was super cool because I was like, I'm gonna wear a tie and I'm gonna wear a jacket and like you guys are wearing your Abercrombie. I'm gonna be so cool. And yeah, people are like, you're a blank and blank. And I was like, mm, okay, whoops. <laughs> I felt the same way. I was like, I'm gonna wear dresses and like these big long earrings. And people were like, why are you? Do-? You know, I like wasn't getting invited to parties. And I was like, why am I doing this? Like, why do I? <laughs> why do I do this to myself when you could just as easily like not? make yourself ostracized socially but i don't know i do think like the call to dress oneself clearly it comes from somewhere like i don't i did not i don't know if you felt the same way it was like why do i do this yeah (laughs) yeah i mean i just i wanted to i wanted to be better like I wanted to, you know, w- we moved high schools because my parents moved. And so the, the high school I went to was like a little bit more affluent and I was not in the same, you know, socio demographic as they were. And uh, that was fine. But I was like, oh, I need to look as cool, if not better than them. And so I'm going to try to do this. And it was also, I loved it. I, th- I mean, at the, like what you were saying, like at the end of the day, like I really loved it. I thought it was cool. I was, I, you know, my heroes were like, people that aren't that cool but I was like <laughs> I got really into Miles Davis at the time and then I remember my friend's um, uncle was like yo Miles Davis like also did all this other stuff so like check your you know and I'm like 15 <laughs> you know and he was telling me about like heroin and all this crap and so yeah it's like uh, every uh, titan that I loved was uh, I was getting checked but at the same time like punk rock music was coming out you know and it was like um, bands like Saves a Day and, and, and uh, Brand New before Jesse got canceled and um you know and so like dressing like them yeah. and wearing like diesel jeans and then recognizing totally. that if you had cool clothes you were cool like that was just it's it's still the greatest thing now like if you go to a certain restaurant or a certain part of New York and you are wearing this like you are cool it's awful but it is still very true there's we no matter what we we can't escape it roman culture same thing uh, yeah 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 <laughs> Yeah. May I ask, what did you do in indie music? uh, I worked for the Beggars Group campaigns for like Vampire Weekend and Interpol and uh, the XX. Cool. Um, Yeah. And it's funny though, because all the other like cool kid bands were all Wesleyan kids. Were they? MGMT. Well, MGMT. That's it. And and then. Okay. That's it. Yeah. Those are two (laughs) gargantuan. Acts. No, it's true. It's like why I went to Wesley and I was like, I want to do that. <laughs> yeah. Wait, wait, did you want to do music? No, 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 no. Uh, I always wanted to do radio, but I was just like, those people are cool. So That's interesting. Yeah. I think I mostly chose Wesley and because they had a really cool college radio station. And I liked that it was an yeah. NPR affiliate and it wasn't like there were student shows and there were community members and there were NPR shows. And so it was actually like a real radio station. And so I spent most of my time at Wesleyan at the radio station. And I was like very, 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 very involved with the radio station. That was like what I wanted to do. And then podcasting. I mean, podcasting is like so different from radio in all the so so many people will be like, oh, it's basically the same. And and it just like philosophically could not be more different in ways that I'm still sort of wrapping my my head around. Yeah, I think the the podcasts and the podcasters that people love the most, it's the fact that they feel that they have things in common with them outside of what the podcaster talks about. Like, which is totally against what your standard journalism yeah, is. Yeah. I mean, and it's why like when I was, you know, trying to do other research and other stuff on you I'm like what are all the it's like it's because you're a journalist like it was I couldn't find how you felt about a b c d and e and all these other really things. that's so um, funny I'm like I mean I didn't yeah. go to journalism school I don't like I'm not a very hardcore journalist nor do I feel like I have any decorum or filter or anything like I just post whatever I want on Twitter so it's funny I think of myself as like 
very out there, but... Well, I mean, yeah, there, there's hot takes here and there, <laughs> but like, that's not... I'm not going to try to get you to discuss a hot take on a podcast. It's <laughs> fucking lame. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, it's just interesting. But this it's like, yeah. Uh, when you were doing the, the interviews with people for the prep stuff, um, I'm curious how often... Or did you meet them and you, you like, cause like people like Alan Flusser, yeah. right? Like that guy wrote the book on menswear and he did Wall Street and he did all this other stuff, but you spend time with him and you're like, he's, he's a nerd. Yeah. He's just yeah. a guy like, yeah. and, and, and it's cool. Like he, he'll say the same thing. Like he's now he's retired, but like he doesn't, he doesn't live and breathe this stuff the way that we like manifest that these people do in our heads. Yeah. It was, it was great. I mean, you know, the funny thing is I feel like when I'm, when I make a show like this, because there's so many people, they're like 30 some odd voices in the show. Mm -hmm. So everyone gets that's sort of like cast into a particular expertise. Oh. So like I mostly talked to Alan Flusser about Ralph Lauren because that's his most recent book, you know? And I don't think I even mentioned that he made the clothes for Wall Street, you know? Because that's almost like an aside. It's a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um... You know, and like Jeffrey Banks, we also are like mostly talking about Ralph Lauren and not really getting into like his own incredible history. So it's funny. Everyone, everyone I talk to, we tended to get very specific about like one part of the story. And there are some voices that come back, you know, over and over again. But yeah, mostly I, I've tried as often as I could to meet people in person just because I think that's the best way to do Smart. an interview. I mean, it involves like a lot of schlepping and, uh, but it's just like, it's just better. It leads, and then it leads to a more uh, relaxed dynamic. But yeah, all these people are just, just nerds. I mean, I have to say, when I first made the leap from architecture into fashion, I was really worried that it would be this very, like, Zoolander-y, you know, <laughs> uh, world of appearances. But most people I encounter are exactly like you. They're like, I'm embarrassed. <laughs> I'm yeah. so aware of the shortcomings of this thing. You know, they're very, and they're <laughs> like, I'm, I read all these books. They love to read. They love to, like, touch the fabric. They're so, they're so dorky. They're so smart. They're so aware. Like, fashion people are great. Fashion people are the best people. They're, 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 they're hippies and they're nerds and they're like zero waste maniacs. I just, I love them. <laughs> yeah, I think it's it's guilt from all oh, yeah. the stuff they consume. You know, you, you can't like, you know, e even then where it's like the, the guy who's buying four pairs of his pants from, you know, whatever website, he might be making waste, but someone like me who's had to buy like 40 pairs of pants and doesn't even keep those, you know, or or is un is upset after a year that he owns them. Yeah. I'm way the hell worse. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of a lot of guilt. Um you've been you've become this or are becoming the sort of expert of all the Ralph Lauren stuff with all the uh interviews and people that you've done connecting to, to big R. Um okay, I I, I I saw the hand wave there. I, I'm just like, I don't know. I feel very wary because I reached out to the man himself, obviously. Like I tried. Sure. Obviously, yeah. he said no. Like, good for him. And I don't know. I just hesitate to call myself an expert on any living person who I've never met. You know, I'm like, I have an Fair. idea of what his story is. I have my own interpretation of his story, which I suppose would be sort of the most terrifying thing about being a famous person is that like other random people can like claim that they're experts on your life and your motivations. So I want to be fully upfront that like, I don't know that man. Well, <laughs> well on, on the company side, yeah. I am curious, what do you think is going to happen with the company and the brand? Because you can't, like Ralph can't, is not invincible. Right. He doesn't have a Lazarus pit right. that we know of. So it's just like what, like I, I often wonder what is going to happen with the future of that brand. I mean, Lord knows. I don't, I mean, it's so strong. It's so strong. Like I just. Oh yeah, I don't. I don't think it's going to go under. It's just like, I just don't know how they're going to evolve it when you base everything off of a living person who can't live forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I have to admit to you, I, again, I'm, I am I consider myself a new fashion nerd, like newly, newly okay. minted. Okay. I cannot say that I really thought about Ralph Lauren before doing this series. I This is another way that I was like, oh, this is a fish learning what water is. I was just like, yeah, Ralph Lauren, it's just there. Like the trees and the grass and the yep. sky. It's just there. I didn't even realize he was still alive. I was like, blah, blah, blah. Like did not, one, did not realize how incredible the brand is and like what Ralph did. Like I didn't realize he was uh -huh. an innovator on the level of like Steve Jobs. I mean, 
I had no idea the contribution that he made to American slash international fashion. Uh, mm-hmm. To I, I didn't. It was my my first understanding of it as a brand. And I think bef- until very recently, and like you know, like before January 2022, when I started doing this research, I I thought about Ralph Lauren in the way that I think most people do, which is just like, yeah, standard. That's just like that's yeah. a good brand. I you know, I was like, I looked in my closet. And I was like, oh, I own a couple of Ralph Lauren stuff. I don't even know how they got here. I'm sure I found mm-hmm. them at like thrift stores and was like, that's a good brand. I don't know. I just think that, yeah, he's, he's so, um, the idea of what will happen to the brand in terms of like aesthetic innovation or whatever that I can't speak to, but I, I don't know. I, I, I think for non-fashion people who listen to this, they will be shocked in the way I was shocked by like recognizing it as a thing and not just yeah. clothes that I took for granted. I mean, yeah, Ralph Lauren's like, it's like a utility. Yes, yes, Like yes. it's just, it's just always available and you're, that's, you know, and there's like it, with different levels of like fashion enthusiasm because on one hand you just, you recognize it's always there, yeah. but then you get deeper into it and you're like, wow, it's this huge thing. But then you get even deeper into it and at least like for me, I'm at this level where like I'm kind of angry <laughs> with with the brand at all times solely because of the fact that like it is impossible to say that Ralph Lauren did all of these things. Mm. He didn't. He has a team. Yeah. He has a brother named Jerry Lauren who's a fucking genius who is who is the the person he's got the deal maker. You have I mean th- there's John Baraja. You have t- tons and tons and tons of of people who have worked at Ralph Lauren over the years. You know, then you have all these designers who worked at Ralph Lauren as like the way that someone went to Harvard Med School. Yes, you yes. know, you like y- you get it to kind of make this sort of uh, elevated, you know, educational experience. And so it's like all those people were strong contributors. Yeah, yeah. Like Michael Bastian's a huge contributor to Ralph Lauren Home, you know, but like the brand forbids individuality other yes. than King Ralph. Yes. And so like that's the thing that in, in a world now where we're trying to recognize that it's not one individual person. It's not just Caesar. It's not, you know, whatever. There's there's is a team. There is a people, there are people behind that. And those stories matter so much because you need someone to hold your arms up, like to get biblical yes, here, yes, right? Yes. So like what what the fuck? Wait, I love that. I love that the galaxy this goes back to everything we've been talking about. That galaxy brain level is like fury. <laughs> that is that's it. It's like <laughs> ignorance, adoration, fury. And that's 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 love. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're right. Yeah. I don't know. Cause it's like there's a lot of Ralph people that listen to this. And there's people that I've talked to over the years and like, oh, I could never do it. Because because at the end of the day, like my name isn't on the label Mm. where it's like, okay, I respect that. But at the same time, you have a a very distinct point of view and perspective and understanding of how you want to approach fashion. And that's why people just end up leaving because they're like, well, fuck it. I mean, I learned this. Maybe I'll just go somewhere else because there's a glass ceiling here. Um, You know, even though you can make a lot of money working at Ralph. Yeah. Well, Um, the other thing that I have to say about it is like the only example that I have, the only parallel that I have is 99% Invisible, which is obviously like the host is the host and creator is Roman Mars and mm-hmm. he's like an amazing boss and he always 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 gave credit always said like there's a team oh you know mm-hmm. if I produced a show I got to voice it and that was like really rare how highlighted he was and even in that situation it was always like Roman Mars's show you know he was always held up that way because people need a name and like a brand to latch on to yeah. they just do it's yeah. sort of the way our little our little animal minds function or you know they forget which show was by which producer but Roman the the constant so that's not to like forgive ralph lauren um i don't i don't know about i, I honestly have not looked as in, in depthly into the degree to which they have or have not like acknowledged their larger team but i feel like the the inevitability of it all is like yeah the name the brand name brand name takes all yeah well and that, i raised this to uh, a person that worked was a vp at ralph and they were like look at the end of the day, like no one cares about the names of the Oompa Loompas. <laughs> like you want, you want to believe Willy Wonka and you want Willy Wonka to be in, in control. And that's like, he's like, Americans want yeah. Ralph. They don't actually care about this. He's like, so we're just giving them what they want. And I was like, that's a fucking cop out though. Huh. Because I know you, why you left. Because you wanted to do more and you wanted, you know. Now some people went crazy because there's Ralph stories, which I cannot even, you know, of people who, it's like succession in there. I mean, but the thing I have to say though, is like, I also read, uh, genuine, authentic. That book on Ralph Lauren. Yeah, yeah. 
which is so like dishy. It's like nothing but it's drama. It's very and dish. dishy. <laughs> and honestly, again, I feel like that's sort of galaxy brain level. Like if you already know Ralph yeah. and who he is and what he did, then you can get into like dishy shit. Mm-hmm. But the show that I make is so, I mean, the, the thing that I always say is that I want it to be for people who are really into clothes and people who think they don't care about clothes at all. Like for people who think they don't care about fashion, they're like, oh, wait, this is like a history. This is a history show, mm-hmm. basically. It's a history show. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so I'm way more interested. And now I'm like, oh, no, this is very like un nuanced point of view but so be it it's very interested in like what ralph lauren means as like the symbol and why people were attracted to the symbol you know why the Mm. the message that he put out in this very like marshall McLuhan-esque, you know symbolic way what was the tractor beam of ralph lauren that that just took off what was his longevity so in a weird way like i don't i don't get into that that stuff and as i was reading genuine authentic i was like this is entirely too too in the oh, weeds yeah. for this yeah that book that book went super nuts <laughs> um it but it is interesting because like yeah i mean what you've done with your show like it it turns into this like really beautiful history lesson i don't know if you ever saw or if anyone flagged it for you reddit went nuts on all the like bo brummel stuff you oh did. Um, i'm sure i'm sure i'm sure it was i mean it was good and i i usually if someone says reddit it means something bad well i know but, like, they're was, like it's a little yeah. i mean looking back on it and like now that i've done more research that's the other thing i'm like mm-hmm. evolving in real time like i feel like in season <laughs> one i was like oh my god you guys close and like season two i was like oh my god it goes deeper and season three i like to i don't know i'm like learning in real time and so so yeah, I, yeah. listening back to some of this stuff, like list, honestly, listening back to the Bo Brummel piece, I was like, oh, this is a little reductionist. You know, like I think it's quite it's bigger than that. And with all of those episodes, well, especially now that I've managed to do like seven episodes on one topic, I'm like, oh, God, I need to revisit all of these and do like seven episode series on all of these. So I'm sure like if there was any debate on Reddit, it was probably very warranted. No, people okay. liked it. I think that's the <laughs> thing is like that, that's that's why I was saying it, because. You you did a a great job of capturing who he is because it was more about the personality. Yeah. No, I don't give a shit about what he wore. Right, right. Like it, but it's like the fact that this person behaved this way. You know. Um. Yeah. I mean, it's it was it was excellent. Oh, it was good. And yeah. And it like every. I feel like every. I don't know. Ten or fifteen years, like people totally forget about yeah. Bill Rummel <laughs> and that, and then like are reminded like what like what sort of preposterous like individual was this person? And yeah, it was great. It was really, oh, thank really you. Did you know? Um, I'm sh- sure. Surely you must have known this, but I love that these like little historical Easter eggs in fashion keep coming back over and over again. Threads, if you will. Uh, like. <laughs> The first Thai company that Ralph Lauren worked for was called Bo Brummel. Oh, that I didn't know. I knew I knew he was doing a Thai company and I knew he was at he was trying to sell stuff at like Paul Stewart. But the did very not know first that. company was Bo Brummel, which yeah, it was like a beautiful little like wink. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wow. There you have it. Um, damn. Okay. This has been super, super good. Um, before we wrap, um, so y- you've mentioned a lot of movies while we were oh. talking. <laughs> Are there any are there any movies to you like series that when that like that you saw that like got you into clothes or pulled you back into mm. clothes? It's very surface level, but it's actually a it's actually a serious question. No, no, no. I think about this a lot actually because so I was I was just in Budapest because my boyfriend's making a movie there and my um and while I was there I got to be uh I got to have a few conversations with the amazing costume designer Ola Stashko. She did the costume designs for like Cold War and Ida. She's oh, wow. Polish. She's incredible. Similarly, she was like, God, what we do is so embarrassing. I was like, really? (laughs) You're an artist. So it's everybody. Um, (laughs) And it was funny because we were talking. I I was like, do you think about what you what you do as impacting culture? Like people see things in the movies and then they they copy them. And then, you know, a huge part of the preppy research, a huge thing that led up to the great American preppy revival in 1980 was not only the election of Ronald Reagan and the preppy handbook and the ads of Ralph Lauren, but this rash of movies in the 1970s, like Animal House, American Graffiti. uh, Yeah, Metropolitan. Yes, the tons of Ivy movies all taking place. Mm -hmm. Um, In the 1970s, there's this whole rash of movies, wave of nostalgia, all about, you know, the time before JFK was assassinated and that just like put the idea in people's head it like sewed all this groundwork for Ralph Lauren and the preppy handbook and all these you know this this huge revival of the look and so movies it is it you know 
This is like, is it a superficial question? This goes back to everything we've been talking about. Like, is it superficial? Is it not? Like, yeah, it does matter. And in terms of my own style, I feel like when I was a kid, the, the greatest fashion movie in my life was Desperately Seeking Susan. Desperately Seeking I I'm like literally going to have to look <gasps> this up. I was, I figured oh, I would. I'm so excited for you. Oh, you're going to love this. Desperately it's the Madonna movie. It's Susan? the first movie Madonna was in. And it's, uh, it's. Oh, wow. 1985. It's fantastic. And it's sort of the origin of the Madonna look where she's wearing like a mesh shirt oh, with all the necklaces. Like yes. that was the, okay. pre, the, the debut of it. And my favorite part is that there's a scene where Madonna, you know, she's not playing herself. Wow. She's playing a character named Susan. Where like Susan yeah. is in a club and a Madonna song is playing and she's like dancing to the Madonna song. And so it's like, oh my God, does this take place in a parallel universe? <laughs> where like... <laughs> With like, I don't know. You're like playing with, with threads of time there. But I feel like that was the first movie where I just watched someone, like a very swaggery woman, just like throw on clothes mm. very effortlessly. And she like goes into a thrift store and like puts on a jacket and like walks out with it. And it just looks great. Just very effortlessly styling herself uh, and behaving in a way that I hadn't seen before. And so... That oh, wow. was my that was my big fashion movie. Do you have one? Uh, no. I mean, honestly, like I got really into North by Northwest. It's which is a trite answer. I mean, Cary Grant was it was just yeah. cool. Um, but I the thing that I always get frustrated about is where like I'm, someone's be like, oh, do you think there's a movie now, or do you think there's an an actor or a a person that's maybe more modern that like people want to look like or and it's like I no, I don't think so. You think at it's all. just because everyone I mean, has a stylist and we don't know who they actually are? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's everyone has. A stylist versus you know when people talk about like Paul Newman yeah. or even like Sidney Poitier and and Cary Grant and and Steve McQueen all those guys like they they would pick out their clothes right. and they they would wear what they wore but also there wasn't so much stuff there wasn't ten thousand stores they were buying things online you know I, the people were like oh Cary Grant he everything was bespoke and it's like later years there's like a lost GQ interview I can send you if you ever want and he talks about he just like buys all this stuff ready to wear because he was like yeah like who wants to wait for their clothes I love that <laughs> and everyone's like heads exploding it's like no. <laughs> Well, it was really interesting. This was something that I talked about with with Ola, with the costume designer. She was like, you know, it, it really is how you wear it. She, she said, like, some yeah. people just look expensive. And some people, I have to style them to look more expensive. But oh, some wow. people, I can put them in a Zara suit and it looks expensive and then we don't have to mess with it. It's like, oh, yeah. right. Yeah, it's it's a it's an attitude. That's crazy. Yeah, I mean, especially with there's so little credit given to costume designers and like Ariane Phillips and other like designers and stuff who've been on here. They don't own their IP. So like to explain yeah. for listeners. So if you're if you're an actor in a movie and you get paid for the movie and then as the movie grows, whether you're a producer or any sort of person, um, as the movie grows and there's additional distribution, you're compensated for that distribution. Writer compensated. If you are a costume designer in a movie that like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, right? Ariane Phillips got a check for that and that was it. She was yeah. paid and she was paid well, I'm, I'm assuming. Um, but like she doesn't get any sort of residuals. There's no, you don't own your IP. You do if you're in Broadway. So the dude that did Hamilton is fat wow, paid. Wow, I did not know yeah. that. That is so interesting. Yeah. yeah, and it's it's kind of fucked up because when you think of all these actors that people want to look like, they're, Right, that was you know, invented by someone, right. Exactly. And, you know, and it's because all these things are always falls down to fairness, you know, versus it's not about being greedy or anything. It's just like, yeah, that she's not getting anything for it. And like, she's a, a G and an icon and she was, you know, awarded a, something from like the whatever Venice Film Festival and stuff. Like she's got prestige, but it's pay her yeah. for it. And I think like that's a thing that is unfortunate with costume designers and stuff now. And it's like, well, do you think that they don't want to do it? Like, what about all the looks from all the Bond right, movies? Right. Early, early Bond movies, those people were paid. I'll be clear. Like it, you used to get money for the costume design that you you own that IP and now you don't. When did that change? Uh, I should know this, but I don't know it. I think it was like in the 80s or oh, something that's like that. So interesting. Um, I had no mm -hmm. idea. Yeah. Oh, I should have talked to Ola about that. That's so cool. Yeah. And so it's like, well, hopefully, you know, because if she makes some banging looks, like think of the people that made all this stuff for Dune or make all the all these things that people buy costumes for. Like uh, totally. Nope. Totally. Totally. No, I mean, it makes so much sense. And at the same time, the idea of like copyright versus trademark gets so yeah. tricky, especially mm -hmm. in fashion, where, as you said, everything is like an appropriation of an appropriation of an appropriation of an appropriation because it's all about playing. What are we doing? We're playing with symbols. We're like, that's that's yeah. all this is. Um, 
So it's so interesting. But it, but it really, there's a line in the sand when you're making a Halloween costume of a look. For sure. And I think that's the thing too, because like people have raised that as a criticism where it's like, oh, well, you you chose this blue shirt. Does the person that made the blue shirt, should they get oh. paid for it too? And it's like, well, sure. But what about, does do we need to give credit to all the makers of acrylic paint? And it's like, well, you use this paint this way. I That's the same blue that Picasso used. Or, you know, like, no, it's, it's still the artist interpreting the, you know, whatever right. that is, especially with some costumes are literally drawn right, right. and manu- you know, and uh, made versus, yeah, I found a vintage shirt and some cool jeans and we put it together. So yeah, yeah, that's, that's always the thing that I think about more now when I look at movies and I'm like, oh, and maybe that's like me getting older, but I'm always like, was that person paid fairly? <laughs> well, like, what were the labor yeah, practices exactly, like exactly, on set? Exactly, exactly, exactly. So exactly. fucked up. <laughs> Galaxy brain. <laughs> is this... <laughs> What is this? Yeah. Yeah. It's it's just, yeah, it, it becomes that sort of, I don't know, like an embarrassing thing. But that's that's cool that you also got to talk to costume designers and stuff. Because I feel like that is now when you talk to anyone and you're like, who's the person you want to be? Or like, what's the what's your, if you had a, a, a physical bulletin board or whatever Pinterest board of like your looks, most cases there, it's always some sort of actor. But who, who made that decision for that actor? Right, right. That's so funny. I don't even, you know, it used to be so clear cut. I used to just like go to the sartorial list and get my inspiration but now i don't even know where i'd look well i mean that's still great i think street style is is that's that's the coolest thing that's happened since the age of the internet is like seeing how people wore stuff uh especially how quick it was like i don't know if you guys if did if you ever followed the like pt womo stuff of like all the peacocks wearing bizarro clothes i mean that's a heartbreak but um i mean that that's still like some of the most fun stuff to see totally 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 it was funny. I was just, uh, when I was in Budapest, we took a weekend to go to Rome and these everyone looked incredible in Rome. And then you look at the actual garments and they're like silly. They were like ridiculous, silly garments. There was this guy wearing like a corduroy jacket with jeans mm-hmm. with like a hu- okay. huge, like flowery, um, oh my God, what's it called? Name's escaping me. Floral? No, the, um, like the, the handkerchief. Oh, like a pocket yes, square? Yes, 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 the pocket square. But it was like a folded okay. in this very like outlandish way. And on anyone else, it would have just looked like a clown costume, but he was just so like- Was he yep. old? Old, handsome, confident. Old people get a pass for and any like, clothes. That, but that's what we, we we were like, okay. It's like high quality, ridiculous clothes worn confidently equals like incredible mm-hmm. fashion. It was very funny though. When you yeah, take them I, down to its component parts, it's like, Ugh. Yeah, there's so much. Someone did this thing once on like Tumblr and they would just replace the face of a bunch of sartorialist <laughs> images with like a younger person and they all looked horrible. And it was like, oh, because what you loved was like the age of that person's face and like the whatever they experienced that led them to make that decision versus, yeah, some sort of flamboyant, you know, extravagance of like a bizarro silk jacket. It just looks like trash. See, Jeremy, it just gets yeah. better and better. <laughs> <laughs> I know I that is one thing I am grateful as like as I've gotten older and I'm like worn a suit or a sport coat or something I'm like oh like I I feel like I look better in this than when I was younger and had hair and you know was very uncomfortable with who I was trying mm-hmm. to be and now it's like yeah I have this is what I have on like that's it it's like this this shirt is well, I don't know 15 years old now or who so made it? and it's like fine this is uh, old Brooks oh. Brothers there you go. yeah Love yeah, it. and it was old Brooks Brothers that I bought versus some people. It's like, oh, uh, this is old Brooks, and it's like, well, but you still bought it a week right, ago, right, right, so right, it's right. new to right, you. Right, 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 right. <laughs> totally, totally, totally. What has your has any of the reporting that you've done or any of the stuff that you've you've been researching changed how you shop? Oh, one hundred percent. I'm like so into preppy clothes now, and and like Ivy clothes. Like I bought a sweater at J Press, and then the fun thing was, okay. is that this look has become so um, generally acceptable that I don't know. I mean, I was wearing the same look to interview Richard Press as I was like, you know. Dallas Penn, the low head, like it was very. And, Wait, what's the look? Oh, just like a, a tennis sweater, just like a V-neck tennis sweater with like a collared shirt. Okay, and you yeah. know, all different people were like, "Great sweater," you know. It's just like a, it's just nice. It's just like nice clothes. And I think when I was a kid, I was like you. I was like. I don't want to wear Abercrombie. I hate this preppy look. I really don't like it. And as I've gotten older and as I've done this research, it's just like, it's so um, approachable. And that's a beautiful... What do you think made it more approachable? Because the clothes didn't change. The clothes didn't change. I think think as I age, I wanted to reach out to more people. Not that I want to fit in. I mean, yeah, I guess it's about fitting in a little bit. Not that I want like rigid conformity Mm -hmm. or that I want to look like everybody else. But, you know, Derek Guy 
says that when you make an outfit, it's like putting a sentence together. And I was oh my very God. fucking Derek genius. That- <laughs> He's, he's great. I love him so yeah. much. He, um, so much of this series was like informed by conversations with Derek Guy. And, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I was very into making illegible sentences, just like, fuck you, <laughs> you're never going to pin me down. And I right. think a preppy clothes, or at least a couple items, make your outfits legible. You know, we know exactly what that means. It's like a, it's like a hi, how are you? If you're wearing like a, a polo shirt, it's this, it's uh-huh. this, um, it's just like spaghetti. I don't know. You can put anything you want on it. It's like you can pair it with anything. It has this, this, um, and I mean that's, and I, this is part of the last episode of the series. That's why it was so potent to be used by members of the far right in charlottesville that's why they're wearing polo shirts it's to look right. accessible and to look normal and to look not scary you know that is part oh, of no. the logic behind these clothes it's nothing um there's nothing inherent in any sort of ideology that makes them about wanting to look rich or look male or look white in looking at the history of these garments they're vi- you know it's extremely jewish it's extremely black it's extremely japanese there's a huge nuanced fascinating history behind them to the point where it just means yeah these clothes just mean like hi how are you and i'm more interested in communicating that in my clothing now less in like proving how different i am and more about wanting to reach out to others so i think that's why i like it now and knowing and knowing the history of the garments really helped me with that yeah dang especially when you think about how wearing some of that stuff lets you in yeah. other places i mean people always make that joke of like oh if you wear a suit you can go use the bathroom yeah. at like whatever hotel totally. or whatever but like that's so freaking true yeah. and i mean i was just in new york and i had a sport coat and i had to use the bathroom and i just fucking walked in and it was like yeah it 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 is strange how that stuff is uh, I forgot who I talked to once, but they told me that like their their idea for their wardrobe is that they basically wanted to be remembered for no more than five minutes after they interacted with someone. And I was like, oh, like oh, that that doesn't make any sense. But when you think about it, like, yeah, like okay, they're approachable, yeah, they exactly, seem fine, and you remember them. And and there's a reason it. that like Ivy has evolved into whatever we call classics or basics. I mean, basically, people wear like a button down shirt and chinos for a date or like a job interview. It just means like, hi, trust me. You know, like, <laughs> I trust yeah, me. it's like, uh, talk to me, you know, it, it, it functionally <laughs> says like, I am trying. Hello. Like, yeah, they're very, very legible clothes and they're able to be and I enjoy them because you can customize them so easily. They're so nothing that like you add, you know, one or two things and it's like, yeah, cool. Yeah. Dang. That's that's very thought. Wait, but like, I mean, you're wearing a button down Brooks collar shirt. Like, surely yeah. you feel this way somewhat. No. Yeah. I mean, but it's more of. Yeah, like I think of it as a staple, but sometimes, you know, I'm too lazy to to question why is this the staple? You know, or it's like I'm fine to go back 10 years, but I don't want to go back 100, you know? Like it's like, "Oh, well, this person, you know, it was this and I got it and this is that experience and that's why I like it." Versus like, "Well, why is this the norm? Like why is why is business dressing still mm-hmm. this way?" And even though it has evolved granularly over the years, but like, why is it still, I I just don't understand. Like, why is it that we feel someone's put together with a tie and disheveled without it? And I don't, I don't know. I don't know if anyone's ever explained that thoroughly without connecting it to just deeper traditions. Like, I don't think there's anything proportionally with someone, because someone would be like, oh, the right collar height would frame your neck and it hides this. Like, Alan Foster would talk about it. It's all hiding Golden ratio stuff. Totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, I, there might be truth to that, but that's like, that might be, that's not the foundation of your entire argument. Um, Yeah. And I think that's, that's the thing too, is a part of me is also gets a little bit nervous. Like, well, if I dig deeper, am I going to not like what I find? I don't know. Something is going to get connected to some sort of history of whatever racism or, you know. (laughs) Especially in clothing, for sure. For sure. For sure. It's like, yeah, don't, don't start studying religion because then you're really going to get fucked up. You know, when you find out like, oh, this religion's fine. It didn't do anything wrong. It's like, well, there are orgies (laughs) in the Vatican. And you're like, oh no. (laughs) Uh, everything's a milkshake duck. But honestly, like, <laughs> while the history of preppy clothes definitely, you know, anything that's an American style is going to interact with, like, slavery and bad labor practices, obviously, and it's, like, at the core of this of this country, the, it, honestly, it, I found it a very redemptive story that it ended up being 
Like, I, I love, and so that's the thing. Like, I love the history. I think the history is very, very fascinating. Okay, how can you, th- this is great because I want to have that more perspective on everything because I, when I find something that I don't like, I'm like, oh no, it's over. And I think that's also even how we're viewing yeah. culture right now. Like if anyone big that makes a mistake, we're like, that person's yeah. over versus like, oh, it's great. They made a mistake or the, the something wasn't, you know, good right. that happened, but let's champion and like w- w- the redemptive thing, yeah. use that word. Like w- what makes you, I mean, everything, you know, when you look at the scope of preppy clothes, which is, again, a story that starts like before, you know, before the war of 1812, like it's a long, long history. You see these like ins and outs. You see that like Brooks Brothers used to manufacture livery, which was worn on some enslaved people. This is like a very tropey fact now, but then it was also worn on black jazz musicians and that, you know, Ralph Lauren refused to acknowledge the black demographic for his clothes, but like ended up making clothes that were like even more embraced by the, like, yeah. by the low heads and the low lives. And you see, I don't know, you, you see like academic institutions putting quotas to try to keep Jews out. But then, you know, oh, yeah. Jewish merchants end up making their clothes for their students better than, you know, the collegiate shops did. You just see these like ins and outs of history as people. It's like this tango, you know, who's and that's what fashion's all about, right? It's like who's in, who's out, who's in, who's out. And as those boundaries grow and shift and change over time, the fascinating thing is like preppy is still around and the Mm. style itself weathers these changes in how trends work. Right. Like people used to want to dress a certain way to look rich. That was preppy yes, clothes. Still D- to a degree. Yeah. Arguably now people more want to dress cool, whatever cool means. Oh, OK. And that and that and that also became preppy clothes. And then people in the 90s after the dress down revolution wanted to dress comfortably. That is also preppy. You know what I mean? It's a very interesting style that has weathered these like demographic changes, these changes in desire, these socio political changes. And at the end, I was just like. You go. Like, this is so cool. Like, <laughs> what an all American story. What, like, in this, in this, in this totally weird, messed up country that I like love so much and I hate so much because I love it so much. Like, that's preppy. It's great. Oh, wow. That's beautiful. That's oh, really thanks. well said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, I definitely think we got oh, cool. it. This was, this was a, ton of fun yeah, it's so um, nice to meet you thank, thank you. you so much please hit me up when no, you're in new york next yeah it was it was my pleasure thank you again it was wonderful talking an to you. honor thanks so much for listening you've been listening to blamo our show is produced by blamo media we're edited by amar lal and our theme music as always by the mysterious breakmaster cylinder if you like what you heard, you know the drill. Do what you do when you like a show. Share the pod with a friend. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever it is you're listening to us on. You can follow us on Instagram for all the hot content. And if you want to talk to us and give us your hot take, we'd love to hear from you. You can call us. Uh, but actually, you know what? Don't call us. I don't I don't really want you to call us. But you can uh, send us an email at info at blamopod.com. Uh, that's going to be better. Look, we used to do a voicemail thing. It's funny. I'm thinking of this. And we were just like... Well, what the hell are we doing? People don't really want to leave a voicemail. And the ones that did, it was so staticky. It, you know, it sounded like I was talking to someone in 1935. Just not, just not a good vibe. But I digress. If you want to hang out with us and join the Blam fam, visit patreon.com forward slash Blamo, where we have tons of exclusive episodes, exclusive series with, uh, what do we got? We got the Triple J show. We got Blamo Presents Derek Guy. And we also have our amazing, incredible, wonderful Slack community. A lot, a lot of good stuff on there. All right, everybody. I'll see y'all soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.